presentation, but I do have some pictures that we're probably going to flip through when I'm done. Uh, it'll touch on a lot of the stuff that I'll talk about. Um, so I'm probably going to need Martin to come up here when this thing is finished and he can get started what has to get started. So uh, my seminar started on the plane here. And it started with a blank piece of paper, and then I had to think about what I wanted to talk about. Uh, Rob invited me to come speak at Expo, and obviously I said, uh, I do it, but what do you want me to talk about? He said, well, you've been doing this long enough, you'll come up with it. So I, I kind of thought what I would do is kind of do my history in coin-op and pinball and what I've done with, uh, you know, the industry, uh, my personal collection, and I'm kind of one of those people that, you know, went to the extreme with taking a hobby, turning it into a business, and then also being an extreme collector. So um, I'm going to kind of start, I guess at the beginning, the title of my, uh, of my seminar is Honey, I Bought a Church. And what that means is at the end of uh, 2019, I ended up purchasing a church for two purposes, to uh, house my business, Pinball Star Amusements, which is a distributorship, and also to house my collection, which outgrew a prior building that I used, a commercial building, outgrew my house, and uh, I needed a place to put everything. So I, kind of, I'm going to walk you through how I got to where I started and how I ended up uh, purchasing a church. Are we still good? Okay. Um, so I'll start off by saying I'm the guy that you always tell your wife that when maybe your wife complains that you're buying an extra pinball machine, if she does that, that I'm the guy that you point to and say, well, at least I'm not him because I can't stop. I love this stuff. I love arcade. I love coin op. Uh, and not just pinball machines. I collect everything. I collect vending machines, old style arcade games, uh, which are uh, pitch and back games, uh, kitty rides, all kinds of crazy stuff, and hopefully we'll be able to show you some pictures here at the end of some of the things that I do. Um, my collecting stuff started, like probably a lot of you, with collecting stuff when you were a kid, and for me it was baseball cards. And, you know, I would collect baseball cards and want to have every card in the set, and back in those days it wasn't just as easy to go into the store and buy the baseball card that you were missing, you know, you might have collected 375 of the cards in the set, and there were three cards missing, and it might have taken you two years to stumble across that card in a box at a friend's garage or something like that. So I've always been one to collect and want to complete the set of stuff, and uh, that kind of parlayed itself into the pinball world, which I guess is good and bad because these things are expensive and they're also very big, so you can't just stick them in a box like you can. Um, we're all set. Okay. I get it. Okay. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll try to pull some pictures up here as I could. So, uh, this one's there. That's my son, Taylor. Uh, Taylor's now 29 years old. Uh, Taylor was born with a mild form of cerebral palsy, and he's what got me started in pinball, uh, believe it or not. Uh, he was having some surgery done to his legs where they were lengthening his heel cords and his therapist said to him, you know, you need to find something that he'll do to stand upright for a long period of time. We don't want him just sitting and, he, you know, we have to stretch his legs and make sure those muscles stretch. And off the cuff, his therapist suggested maybe an arcade machine or a pinball machine. Now, I always played video games when I was a kid. I wasn't much into pinball. I was a child of the 80s, uh, born in the 60s. I was a teenager in the 80s, so, you know, I was sticking quarters and Miss Pac-Man and Galaga and Space Invaders and all that sort of stuff. So, but I was intrigued by pinball machines. So this was maybe, you know, 2002. Went on the internet, what there was of the internet then, and I tried to find pinball machines where I lived. And I found a guy that had, you know, a little pinball business that he resold used games. And that Christmas, I ended up buying three machines very cheaply for, you know, my son's purpose. And it very quickly became an obsession of mine. I found myself going to work late. I found myself tinkering with them and trying to learn how to fix them. I found myself cleaning them up on weekends. And soon enough, those three first pinball machines morphed into more. 
Um, and it also then became something that, this is my other son, this is Patrick. It became something that my son Patrick and I did as a hobby. He would go to shows, we'd go all over the country, we'd go to shows in California, we'd do tournaments. That particular picture is from Expo, uh, I don't know what year, maybe 2010 or 11 or something. And uh, they had an Expo, Expo Brawl tournament that was a doubles tournament. And I'd bring my son and, and we'd end up doing a tournament together and we had a lot of fun with that. So I built a lot of bonding memories with my other son through pinball because we traveled together. We always took a couple extra days, you know, after a show and we would visit the city. If we went to San Francisco, we would spend an extra day in San Francisco. So we got to see a lot of the country and bond through pinball. When he was about 13, he became a better pinball player than me, constantly beating me. And that, I, it was fun for me to see that he, he got into something a lot that I loved, but uh, it's not fun not being able to beat him anymore. So yeah, that, that wasn't good. Uh, so then back in the day, we, um, we bought pinball machines on eBay for the most part. Uh, there was a website called RGP, uh, which was kind of like the predecessor of Pinside. And pretty much if you got games, you were getting them from operators or you were getting them from containers overseas. Um, and a lot of times they weren't in great condition. So a lot of the games had to be restored and fixed up. And one person that I hooked up with initially was Chris Hutchins, who owns High End Pins. And I started sending some of my games to Chris to be restored. And uh, back then, that was a big argument. You know, people debate things on pin side now, the cost of games. Back then, it was the debate of whether it was proper to restore games, whether it was proper to put that much money into them, whether it was proper to, you know, bling them out as much as Chris did uh, back to originality and make the games really nice. So uh, there's always been some drama in the hobby and it just changes from time to time. Um, and I started trying to collect other stuff. You know, I started getting into jukeboxes and uh, vending machines, soda machines, popcorn machines, uh, unique old arcade stuff like uh, pitching bats that had a basketball theme, and, and back in the 60s and 70s, they made games that were really unique because they were different, and they weren't just, you know, a standard puck bowling, bowling game. There was a bowling game, but maybe there was some aspect of bowling uh, or basketball involved with it. So, you know, I have some pictures. Hopefully, we'll be able to get some time to show you some of those. So, my hobby went from a couple pinball machines that were from the 90s, and then with pinball, I started discovering era you know, each era back in time. So I initially collected the, the, the 90s games, and then I went back, not so much in the 80s, but I kind of skipped into the 70s games. I really fell in love with Wedgeheads from the 60s and other games in the 70s. I love drop targets. A lot of that era has drop targets in their game, so they were appealing to me. Uh, then I discovered Wood Rails. You know, maybe another year later, I started buying, and I'd buy two or three wood rails and work through which ones I thought I liked and wanted to keep. And uh, eventually, I ended up back in the 1930s with pre-war pinball machines. And the common thread with all of them is that I, I love them all. They all appeal to me in some manner. The 90s games had multi-balls and complex rules that you had to learn. But sometimes I'd come home from work after a bad day and I just wanted to have a, a five minute game. I didn't want to play for 20 minutes, you know, going through different modes and wizard modes and multi balls and stuff. I, I wanted to play a simple three minute game. And a lot of those older games are just very addictive and simple rule set. And I love them. So I think that's one thing that's maybe missing a little bit today is a lot of new people coming into the hobby, even though I sell the new things. Um, I don't see a lot of people, you know, getting exposed to the older games and getting an appreciation for them. So, it, you know, if you haven't played a Wedgehead or a Wood Rail, you know, the Wood Rails are pretty slow playing, but they've got great Americana. They've got great artwork on them. Um, you really should try to put some time on them and appreciate them uh, for the gameplay. You know, they're addicting. They're those type of games that, well, I, I got this far and I need it. one more drop target. I got to hit start again. And it's not going to, you know, you're not going to break a sweat playing them like you might some of the newer stuff. Uh, 
So my first new in box game that I bought was probably five years later. Uh, my distributor was Jack from Pinball Sales, and he's now Jersey Jack. And Jack was a distributor like I am back in the day. And I learned a lot from Jack. Sometimes at that point, I didn't really understand what I was learning or where I would use it. Um, but I remember I got a NASCAR game. And when I got the game, there was some damage on the front of the cabinet and somebody markered it. And I knew it wasn't Jack because he sold me the game new in the box, so it was either Stern or it was the, ca the cabinet manufacturer that repaired the game. And I complained about it a little bit, but I, you know, I said, yeah, I just want you to know I sent him a picture. It's a little disappointing to spend this much money. All the complaints that I get today from my customers when something isn't perfect with the game, and rightfully so. Um, so about two weeks later, I get a call from a trucking company that they have a, a, a crate for me. I'm like, well, I'm not expecting anything. They said, well, we have it here. This is your address. I said, yeah. I said, okay, deliver it. They brought it, and it was a Stern box. I opened the box up, and it was a empty NASCAR cabinet uh, from Stern that Jack on his own had bought for me to replace the cabinet that I was disappointed in. He certainly didn't need to do that, certainly didn't need to pay for it, and I certainly had no interest in swapping out a cabinet at that time. So um, I gave Jack a call and he said, well, you weren't happy, and that's important to me that the customers are satisfied whether or not Stern paid for it or whoever's fault it was, it was my responsibility to make it right for you. And that's kind of a lesson that I carry with myself now as a distributor. And I try to think back how I felt when I got something that I spent my hard earned money on that wasn't up to par. So I always think back to that and try to think that, you know, should I step in, even if the company isn't going to do something for the customer, is there something I can do to help them out to make them have a good experience? So, um, you know, Jack always had that, uh, you know, that mindset with himself. So from there, I continue to buy new in box games every so often when one came out that I had an interest in. And um, lo and behold, in 2011, Jack decided that he was going to start a pinball company, Jersey Jack Pinball. And being a close friend of his, after a couple months after the announcement, I was talking to him and, and I said, is there anything I can do to help? Anything I, I can be involved with in some way? I had no idea what. Uh, in my other career, I, I am in sales. And he said, you know what? He goes, I know you own a business. I know you know how to handle money. I know he, you know how to handle customers and make sure they're taken care of, and that's what I want. He goes, I want people in the hobby to sell my games. I don't want the 800-pound you know, commercial gorilla. I want people in the hobby that are known and, and that can take care of people. So that's kind of where I became a distributor, was thinking I, I was thinking this was just going to be a small little side business uh, for myself that I would have fun with, and it's grown into a business where I sell you know, over the years, I've sold thousands of games, millions of dollars worth of pinball machines for something that I just be, would, thought would be a little hobby business. And it's been great watching the hobby expand, you know, since that time when Jack started. Um, and it was also a way for me to fund my own addiction. You know, in my own mind, I'm thinking, well, if I buy a new box game maybe once every two years, maybe this is a way I could buy one every year. Or I could buy you know, more of the ones that I like, and it was kind of a way that I can justify spending more money on, on new and box games. Uh, also with that, and the reason I brought my, my boys up at the beginning of the seminar, is Jack's first game was Wizard of Oz. And when my son was young, he had to have a number of surgeries, like the one that I mentioned, and we'd always be at a children's hospital in Philadelphia. And I'd be down there, and I always got to take my son home, which was a great thing. You know, he had a disability, and it's going to affect him for his whole life, but I always got to take him home. And when I was in those hospitals, I'd see kids that were cancer patients, were burned victims, and they weren't going home. So that made me think, before I even had the distributorship, that I felt guilty. I was like, wouldn't it be great for these kids to have a playroom where they would have pinball machines in there to play because I knew that they had activity rooms. They would have arts and crafts, uh, video games, um, 
uh, puzzles and things like that that the kids can that were stuck in the hospital can go there and they had you know child life services people that would work with them during the course of the day and give them fun activities to do and I always felt guilty that I was taking my son home and I had all these pinball machines at home many of which I didn't turn on you know for a week or two at a time and it would be great to always have them you know to have them in the hospital for the kids so that was in my head for years and then when Jersey Jack started his company and Wizard of Oz was the theme, it literally was like an anvil dropping on my head that I have to do this. I didn't have a choice. This was an idea that I had years ago and now had an opportunity with a great theme to do it with, and I had the wherewithal with my company to somehow fund it and create it. So what I did is we would run tournaments. Uh, we would run, I was the precursor to the raffles. I started doing some raffles. Uh, we did tournaments here at Pinball Expo. We did tournaments at Papa in Pittsburgh. And uh, we raised money. And I also set aside a portion of the profits of every game that I sold into a side account that I used to purchase uh, Wizard of Oz machines. And over that time, we purchased five Wizard of Oz machines that I donated to St. Christopher's Hospital in Philadelphia. Uh, which was where my son got treatment. Um, a customer of mine had an affiliation with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which is a different hospital, it's called CHOP, um, and he wanted to donate one there, so I partnered with him. I did one out in Pittsburgh because the people at Papa were so wonderful to always allow me to come there and bring the Wizard of Oz games and run little side tournaments, and that wasn't really a show like that. It was more of a tournament space. They allowed me to do that, so I thought it would be great to give back to their community. And then the last two machines I donated to Project Pinball, who had already started doing the same sort of thing that I was doing. Uh, and I donated my last two machines to Project Pinball. We placed one in New York City, and another one went to North Carolina. Um, and from there, I saw that Project Pinball had the network that they were starting to build, because these games have to be maintained. They, you need a repair person in those cities to repair the games and take care of them when something breaks, because that's the worst thing. You don't want a child going into the room excited to play the pinball machine, and it's not working. So, um, you know, Dan Spoiler was working on putting all that stuff together, and I ended up deciding that I was kind of going to step aside, and, and I did what, I, what was important to me, which was put one in the hospital where my son was, and then we did four more beyond that and then kind of Dan took the mantle from there uh, with Project Pinball which makes me very proud that you know he continues to this day we were talking today that he continues to do that uh, so then uh, Pinball Star st Pinball Star started and uh, I had the charity thing already taken care of and I was a new distributor there weren't a lot of distributors there weren't a lot of distributors like there are today out on the floor and uh, I decided to do a really aggressive marketing blitz I, I blitz I wanted the pinball star name out there I wanted my logo out there and the first uh, show that we did we came to pinball expo probably 2012 or 13 and we did it all I've got some pictures if we get time to show them um, we did water bottles I purchased probably 50 cases of water at Sam's and we put our own labels on the water bottles and we handed them out at the outside of every seminar and outside of the uh, uh, the rooms where the you know the games were uh, we did door hangers which I got, actually got in trouble for I'm glad Rob left the room but we got in trouble for that uh, my son and I walked around the entire hotel every single floor and we put a door hanger with pinball star the Wizard of Oz and a little discount we were offering on every single door in the hotel and uh, when the show was over, I got a call from Rob's partner at the time, Mike Pesak, and uh, Mike wasn't too happy with me. Uh, Mike's here at the show today, which is nice to see him back at Expo. Um, but Mike wasn't happy. He said, you can't do that. He goes, you can't walk. You can't put stuff on the doors. And, and, and then I got in trouble because some of the ice spilled on the floor uh, from the water bottles. So, but, you know, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get our name out there, and I wanted to meet people. And I wanted to start selling machines and sell as many Wizard of Oz machines at that time. Um, and the nice thing is I made my first sale as I was walking on the plane at O'Hara. My phone rang. I picked my phone up. And some guy I didn't know from Chicago said, oh, I saw, you know, your flyer. I saw your door hanger or whatnot. And he goes, you know, I want to purchase a Wizard of Oz. So it was kind of cool that I went to my first show, didn't sell anything the whole show, met a lot of people. And then before I got on the flight to go home, I had my first pinball machine sold. So that's where it started. From there, 
Uh, and I attribute Jack Winery to starting the resurgence of pinball and the boutique companies that came after him. I think it's all because Jack took a chance and started making a game fully featured with an LCD screen, with magnets, with all kinds of mechanical toys on them. Because prior to that, there was no competition to Stern, and they frankly just weren't doing that. They're a great company. They kept pinball alive. but. When someone new came in the market, they had to up their game, and it also brought a lot of other players into the market. All the companies you see today, American Pinball, Spooky Pinball, Dutch Pinball, Pinball Brothers, all the, all the new people that are on the floor today uh, that are making new games that are just coming out, uh, that's all great stuff, and it's all because Jack took a chance and started a pinball company and wanted to do something that nobody else was willing to do. So um, the growth of the hobby... I attribute, you know, specifically to him. Uh, we continue to build the business uh, through Facebook, uh, email marketing. Uh, we did a lot of shows. I do reveal parties. Uh, whenever a new game came out, like if The Hobbit came out, I had a bunch of locations in Pennsylvania where I'm from, and we would bring the game and do parties, and Jack would, always gracious, Jack would always come to the parties and be there and meet with people and sign anything he needed signed. I print up posters, Jack would sign 500 posters for me, and we'd give them out to the people. So uh, it was all about getting the word out and also trying to grow the hobby and get new people involved, and, and uh, we were hopefully successful with, with doing that. Obviously, my, my business did well. Uh, we did a lot of shows, and a lot of times we would bring... I think my biggest show maybe was Replay Effects, and we brought 35 games there. And let me tell you, that's not an easy thing. Uh, show some appreciation and thank the distributors that are here at Expo. Uh, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of physical work. Uh, it's a lot of sleepless nights and then tearing down and bringing everything home and unpacking everything. And frankly, a lot of times you don't make the sales at the show. Uh, it's really the residual stuff that you get after the show, the relationships that you made, the people you met, and hopefully they remember you and give you a call after the show or even nine months later if a different game comes out that they want to buy, they remember that you made the effort at the show. So, uh, you know, we, we got to the point where we were bringing so many games to the show, uh, big Penske trucks filled with games and I think today I don't do it's hard to get inventory number one but we don't do shows and boots of that size um, any longer uh, because of the difficulty of getting the games and also the price of the games you know every game that's on a shelf on the booth floor you know we're purchasing and, and putting in the booth um, but it was a lot of fun to bring all those games and have people come up to us afterwards and even if they weren't buying something just say hey thank you for bringing uh, you know all the games to the show you made the show for me I really wanted to play the Hobbit or dialed in or whatever the new game was at that point uh, from there we started picking up other companies uh, after 2013, 2014, more pinball companies started coming onto the market, and we picked them up as carriers. Uh, I was the first distributor for Spooky Pinball. Whenever we market Spooky Pinball, I'm always proud to say that I was their first and still their largest distributor, and that was because I kind of had faith in Charlie Emery of what he was doing and uh, his mindset. wasn't necessarily, you know, that he had technical skills that I knew about or that I thought he knew more about pinball, but I knew he was a good, honest person, and I knew he was always trying to do his best, you know, with the games. He was always very conscious of the price. Trust me, him and I had had arguments over time where I would always tell him, I think, you should charge a little bit more and then put that money back into the company to hire employees. And he always wanted to keep the price point at 6000 6500 whatever America's Most Haunted and Rob Zombie was. Um, from there, I suggested to Charlie that actually my first interaction with Charlie was asking to be a sponsor on his podcast. So we had a segment on his podcast that ran every month called the Pinball Star of the Month. And I would get somebody that I knew in the hobby, maybe somebody that wasn't 
strictly like a pinball designer or people that have been on other podcasts like clay had the uh you know the old this old pinball podcast and he had all the you know the people from chicago all the designers on his show i wanted different people i wanted an operator i wanted a location owner like brad baker here at pinball garage in ohio uh i wanted somebody that i knew that collected wood rails and try to get some different you know information out there to the people that were listening to the podcast for so for a few years uh we did a segment on the spooky pinball podcast called the pinball star of the month and then from that is where my relationship with charlie started he was struggling to sell games and he wasn't traveling to shows outside of the midwest and i said hey i i bought a game i was actually his first customer i said let me take my game to the shows that i do with pinball star no no financial relationships let me just get the exposure out there and then from there you know we were a little successful and i ended up becoming a distributor for charlie he said i think it'd be great to have you on the team and i became a spooky distributor and i was probably the only spooky distributor for you know, maybe five years, three or four different games, and then a few other fellows came on. Uh, but they still have a very limited number of uh, distributors. But uh, I was always proud to be their first one and, and their largest. Um, in the meantime, my collection uh, kept growing. Uh, obviously, I, I had some profits from Pinball Star that I now can justify being a crazy collector. And that collection that started with three games, became 20, became 40, became 80, became 120, and soon enough I had games of every era. I had unique arcade games of all different styles, and I loved just going to shows and discovering something different. If there was something coin-op that I hadn't seen before that was, you know, maybe a different genre, I'm trying to think like vending machines I wasn't into initially, and then all of a sudden I appreciated vending machines. I bought a cigarette machine, I bought a soda machine, I bought a candy machine, and I'd go there to pull a soda out. I wouldn't go to the refrigerator. I would go and stick the dime in and pull the Coke, you know, the Coke out of the machine. And for me, it was fun. I always thought, well, where was this machine? And some of you may do that with your pinball machines. Where, where did this thing live before I had it? Was it in a smoky bar? Was it in a, uh, a bowling alley? And I always loved uh, having you know, on pinball machines, maybe burn marks on the wood rails and somebody's cigarette. Um, to me, that's like history. That, that tells a little story that, that that game has a little history to it. Um, you know, and, and, the, and we picked up more companies. Uh, we ended up continuing to do shows. And, uh, you know, one thing I've always tried to do is always try to be a good steward to the hobby. Um, new people coming into the hobby. If you're at a show and there's somebody next to you and they seem like they're new, you know, explain the game to them. Tell them, you know, what to do. Um, I always try to spend time with a newbie that calls me to purchase their pinball machine. They always say, I don't know anything about them. I don't know how hard it is to fix them. I've never owned one before. And I know I'm going to be on, on the phone for an hour. And uh, fortunately, I have a very patient wife, Michelle, who's sitting over there that she sits in the car if we're driving somewhere and she, she hears the same conversations a thousand times and she lets me do my thing. But I love talking to new people in the hobby and I'll spend time with them. And a lot of times I'll never ask for a sale. I'm just trying to educate them about what's out there, the different companies, the different themes. I try to ask them questions about what they're interested in. Do they like sci-fi? Do they like rock bands? Do they like movies? And from there, we can kind of you know, wiggle our way to find out what might be the best machine for them. Because ultimately, from a selfish standpoint, if somebody doesn't like pinball that bought their first machine and spent $10,000 on them, they're not going to buy number two. So I always want to make sure that they love what they buy and that it's something that, you know, like the Lay's potato chip that you can't just have one, that they're going to want more and more after that. Uh, so it's always nice when I get off the phone with somebody and they say, you know, you weren't the first distributor I called, and I called so-and-so, and after three minutes, they asked me if I was ready to buy or if I knew which one I wanted to buy. And they said, I've been on the phone with you for an hour, and you haven't even asked me once whether I wanted to buy something. And that's kind of cool. I, I like when I hear that because it means that, you know, I'm doing what I want to do, which is kind of, again, try to be a good steward to the hobby. Um, you know, throughout all those years, I made so many great friends, uh, other distributors, 
location owners, uh, companies that I worked for. Uh, I'm going to mention Brad again because he's sitting there. Uh, he told me he was going to heckle me, but he hasn't done that yet, so I'm going to be nice to him. Uh, Brad owned VP Cavs, which is a virtual pinball company, and we ended up representing Brad for a number of years until he recently you know, got into um, you know, the business of owning the pinball garage. So I, and Brad and I, we text daily, maybe not multiple times a day. Michelle's shaking her head too because there's nights that she's like, and she calls these guys that I text all the time that we just joke back and forth or talk pinball. She calls them my pinball girlfriends. So Brad, you are my pinball girlfriend. Um, uh, well, you know, you're kind of cute. <laughs> all right. So then uh, that kind of brings me, I'm trying to go chronologically, kind of brings me to like 2017 to 2019. And at that point, two things were happening. Uh, I married my wife, Michelle, and we had a plan to build a new house. So I had to decide what I was going to do with my collection, which was now, unfortunately, I always had a rule that if something came in, and a lot of you may have this rule, if new one comes in, one's got to go because you only got so much room and I would never wrap a game up in a blanket and shrink wrap and store it. But I started doing that. And I ended up filling rooms of an office building that I own with games that were wrapped up that maybe I had fishtails in my house for 10 years. And I'm like, you know what? I got to pull that out because I got something new coming in, but I still like fishtails. I don't want to sell it. So I'd wrap it up. I'd put it in the basement of my office building. And by the time a few years passed and I get to the late, you know, 2010s, 2017 to 19, I probably had 50 to 75 games wrapped up in my basement that didn't have a home and I felt bad. Every once in a while I rotate games in and out, but I needed a plan. So we were gonna build a new house and I thought, that's great, I'm gonna build an outbuilding or I'm gonna dig the basement out underneath the garage and I had my contractor give me a quote to dig out underneath the garage and there was like rebar and you know, pillars that had to be put in. He gave me the price and I'm like, that's ridiculous. Like, I can't, I can't justify doing that. And then I got prices to put an outbuilding, like a pole barn on my property. And that was outrageous too. So finally I thought, I'm going to buy a commercial building and I need a new home for Pinball Star. I was operating it out of an office building. Uh, it wasn't really conducive for trucks to come and do deliveries. Uh, I didn't have a place to have a, a real showroom. And I decided that I wanted to look for a building. And that's where the church comes in. So we ended up going around with my real estate agent one day and looking at buildings, and she was showing me industrial park type buildings, uh, crummy, dirty uh, concrete buildings next to the railroad tracks, and I don't want any of that. I wasn't worried about someone stealing pinball machines, but I certainly didn't want somebody breaking in and going with a hammer and breaking all the glass. I'd have a real mess on my hands. So uh, at the end of the day, we spent the whole day looking at buildings. I said, nothing's going to fit my need here. I kind of told her what I wanted it for. And she said, well, I'll put my thinking cap on and I'll get back to you. About three days later, she called me back. She said, you know, I have this church. Would you want to look at it? It's been on the market for 20 years, off and on. I said, sure, I'll take a look at it. I went and looked at it, and it was beautiful. It was a 60s, older 60s style church. And it had exactly what I needed. It had a huge room, which was the chapel. It had other little small rooms that were very large that I was going to be thinking in my mind as I'm walking through. There's, a, there's three rows of pinball machines. There's four rows of pinball machines. Every room I went in. And I didn't have to do a lot to the building. It was in a nice residential area. And it was accessible to tractor trailers. So it was gonna, I could have my showroom. And I could have my whole collection that I've been wrapping up and putting you know, in the basement of my office building at this building. I remember when I left, I called my wife and I said, I think I want to buy a church, honey. That's the title of the seminar. So uh, long story short, we ended up buying the church. It was a really reasonable price building. And uh, in 2020, right before COVID, we closed and I started going through the building. We had to take all the pews out of it. Uh, we had to clean up all the other rooms. I didn't really have to do much. Uh, carpeting and flooring was good. We, we painted the walls and made things nice. Um, and then we started moving the games in. And that took, and it, it, we did it through COVID as well on weekends, uh, but that probably took a good six months for us to move 
every game that I had uh, at the various locations wrapped up into the building and then organizing them in the building, setting them up, testing them. Some of them hadn't been opened up in a number of years. So um, it was a project that took six months every single weekend. I had customers come help me. I had my delivery staff come and help me. Uh, I had a couple local guys that every weekend that had a trailer, they would come. It was a lot of hard work and it was kind of my project during COVID. Uh, so it was nice that I was able to use that time uh, to kind of get everything set up in the church. And the cool thing, I'm a collector. I already said that, right? So what I was able to do is when I laid the rooms out, I thought, well, it drives me crazy when somebody posts their pictures of their game room and they have all the Jersey Jack games and they got The Hobbit dialed in, then Wizard of Oz, then Willy Wonka, then Pirates. And I look at it and I'm like, they're not in order. They're supposed to be in chronological order. So that's kind of what I did in the church. Every room, the games are in chronological order. Uh, if it's the room, the Sunday school room has all the 90s D&D games. They're in chronological order in the date that they came out, down the rows and back up the rows. The chapel, uh, the biggest part of my collection are all the Stern games. Uh, I have every Stern game of the modern era from, uh, I think, Strike... Uh, Striker Extreme was the first one, uh, all the way through, and they're all in alphabetical order up and down the rows. And the, but the neat thing that I was going to touch on is I was able to, I had the right number of games that I have one room that it's all wedge heads and wood rails. I have one room that's all the 70s uh, Bally games like Harlem Globetrotters and, and Dolly Parton and the Rolling Stones and Captain Fantastic. Uh, I've got another room that's all the DMDs, the Bally Williams stuff from the 1990s. And then the chapel, uh, two-thirds of it is all the Stern games, and then the, the other third of it is all the new stuff, uh, the J JJP, the Spooky, the American Pinball, uh, all the companies that I sell for, those are on the other side. So I have a little showroom for all the new games that we sell, and I have my personal collection. Um, and then at my house, what I do is I keep the couple most recent games from each company. I'll keep maybe two Jersey Jacks, two Sterns. Uh, maybe an, a, another game or two, and then I'll, I pick, I handpicked one of each era, one wedge head, one red, wood rail. So I have a nice little variety at my house, but the majority of all the pinball machines are at the church. And all the arcade stuff, that's all at my house. All the pitch and back games, all that sort of thing. The church is just strictly uh, pinball machines. Um, and I have a tech. Uh, I use Ray Brackens at White Area Repair in Philadelphia. Uh, he comes up once every two months, spends a day, and anything that needs to be fixed, we keep lists for him. He comes through, fixes everything. Uh, you know, my collection now is probably 250 to 300 pieces. And I say pieces because some things are, are small, uh, you know, countertop games from the 50s or unique stuff. Uh, I have about 200 pinball machines at the church. Uh, they're all operational. Everyone works. Everything's in great shape. There's no... Games that are broken down, if they are broken down, we get our tech to fix them. Um, now, one thing with the church, being that it was in the 60s, in the 60s, everybody walked to the local supermarket, everybody walked to the school, the church, and things like that. So there's not a lot of parking there. Um, and also, I had to be very careful with zoning, coming out of a church zone, zoned building into a kind of a commercial space. I had to be very careful. So my zoning is for... Uh, storage of my personal collection. I was honest and told them I operated a business and that it would be low maintenance. I'm not looking to open an arcade. Uh, I don't want people dropping quarters, uh, but I do have a plan to hopefully start having events at the, at the building, uh, have some tournaments that we can get a bus and maybe have people park at a nearby shopping center and then we'll bring people to the church. You know, it could probably fit 100 people at a time comfortably with all the games and the space that we have there and just shuttle people back and forth and be able to share the collection. Uh, I went to visit Rob's uh, Pastimes Arcade in August and it was just great. Uh, by, by far, it's the best collection that I've ever seen. Uh, Rob Burke that runs uh, the Pinball Expo. Uh, everything is operational. He bought a supermarket, kind of... Uh, 
the same idea that I had to start sharing your collection with the community and just on a bigger scale. He's got one big room. Everything is in fantastic shape. He's got some really rare, unique games there. Um, so I, I was thrilled. I spent all day there uh, with Rob. Uh, what else do I want to talk about? Um, I've got some rare stuff. I've got some prototype games, different things. Uh, I'm not really into like having the highest value game or f having the rarest game. To me, it's all about gameplay. Um, I've had some antique arcade games that were really sought after and rare, and I play them and they're boring. But everybody clamors for them at auctions. They go for high prices. I'll sell it because if it's not fun to play, I don't want to look at it. I want to play it. I want to experience it. I want people to be able to play it and, and enjoy it. Um, so I, I do have some rare stuff. I have a prototype. Probably the newest thing I've got is I, got, I have the prototype game that Pat Lawler made uh, when he was designing uh, Bonsai Run. And back in the day, they wouldn't share their, their information with other designers of what they were making. Uh, they would go home and make a prototype of something if they had an idea in their head, and they wouldn't share it with anybody. They did this with Pinball 2000, with the uh, Revenge from Mars game with the hologram in it. Uh, they, and, and Pat did it with the Bonsai Run game with the vertical play field. He made a game at home. It's called Wrecking Ball. Um, it's made of plywood. It's the ugliest thing you ever want to see, but it's a working game, and it's Pat Lawler's idea of wanting to make a vertical play field on the back of the game. And I, in the church, I have his, his prototype game that he, and then what they would do, they would bring it into Williams, and he would say, here's what I came up with. What do you think? And that particular game, they actually rejected it. The story is, is that they didn't want to do it, and Pat put his tail between the legs, put it back in the, in the van, brought it back to his house and stuck it in his, in his pole barn or shed in his, in his backyard, he told me. And that's where it sat. And then about a year or two later, they decided, hey, bring that thing back, that monstrosity that you made. We want to take a look at it. And from there, they made Bonsai Run. So in the church, I have the two of them side by side. I have the prototype and the actual Bonsai Run game that they ended up making. And they are different. There's a couple of nuances that are the same, but some of them are different. Uh, what else interesting can I talk about? Uh, celebrities. Um, celebrities love pinball. And uh, I've had the good fortune to uh, work with some of them and deliver games to some of them. Uh, we delivered Rob Zombie's Rob Zombie game to his house. He's got a house in Connecticut. Charlie Emery from Spooky gave me a call and said, Hey, I was going to do this myself, but I really don't have the time to do it. I'd like to see if, you know, you want to deliver his game. We're going to ship it to him. You go there, you set it up and set it up in his, and he had a barn, which was his man cave. He did his paintings in there. He's an artist and uh, he had all kinds of, uh, if, you, if you know Rob Zombie, he had a lot of like crazy stuff and it was really cool to see. So I delivered his game to him. Uh, we delivered um, Neil Patrick Harris as a magician, the actor, Doogie Hauser. Um, he loves, he's a, he's a magician, and his, uh, what do they call him, his manager actually bought a Houdini game for him for his birthday. They went through American Pinball, and American Pinball called me and said, hey, Joe, you're a great distributor for us. Would you like to deliver Neil, Practi Neil Patrick Harris's game to his house in New York City? So we did that. My wife and I went. We had a lot of uh, fun that day visiting his house and and touching things we shouldn't have been touching and, and, and looking at his Emmys and stuff. Uh, but by far the most interesting thing, and I know we're going to wrap up here, uh, that we did is we delivered uh, a dialed-in game to Guns N' Roses backstage at one of their shows in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was something that Jack set up for me in 2016 or yeah, 15 or 16, 17. Uh, Guns N' Roses was still on the drawing board in terms of uh, being a theme that Jersey Jack was going to do, and he asked me, would you like to bring a game to, for Slash to play? He wants to show the whole band what we do and what our games are like, and I said, absolutely. So we spent a whole day with Slash. When I tell you he was the most down-to-earth guy that you would ever want to meet, all he cared about that day was pinball. Uh, there were other people there that wanted his attention, and he just stood there and played pinball with us all afternoon. And then when the concert was over, he came back, and 
there were a lot more people there, and he still just wanted to play pinball, which was kind of cool. Uh, he actually told me when we were leaving, he put his arm around me, and just like you would expect Slash to sound, he said, dude, he goes, I got to tell you. He goes, I almost screwed up my guitar solo because all I could think about was going backstage after the concert and playing pinball. That was like the, the best comment he could have ever said to me, and it was a great ending to a, a fantastic day. So uh, that's pretty much it. You know, I, I've got other stories I can tell. I could talk forever. Um, Pinball's a great thing. I'm glad you're all here. I'm glad everybody enjoys it. Uh, some of my best friendships are through the pinball hobby and the business. I've been made some great friends with, you know, customers and uh, people that I work with in business. So uh, continue to do what you're doing. Continue to share the hobby with other people. Uh, continue to uh, show children pinball machines that don't understand what they are, uh, help them out at a show, and uh, keep coming to the shows and supporting the shows, support your distributors, support the mod makers and everybody that does things in the hobby, uh, the tournament directors, um, everybody is doing really good stuff in the hobby and, and just try to support them. So thank you very much. I hope you had a good time and sorry we didn't get to the pictures, but there's always next year. <laughs>